Hello there, and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast for the premiere of the 11th episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. This is the penultimate episode of the story, and these last two episodes are longer than the previous ones, almost two hours actually. This episode will bring you no less than six chapters, The Rescue, The Key, The Queen, The Tunnel, The Beach, and The Viper. Brace yourselves for an action-packed episode and don't forget to like our video or podcast on other platforms and write comments. We still haven't heard from our 5,001st subscriber, Shake Your Ass, but if you're him, you can still send us an email or contact us through social media like Instagram, Facebook or Discord. All the data are in the description. But since we so desperately want to reward someone, we're also moving on to the next subscriber, who is simply called Emily, also known as at user hyphen KE3ZF3MG3K. You see, we're not cheating, as we would have picked someone easier to contact if we were. In the meantime, we really appreciate your reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, and we love your speculations about the story. If you haven't joined our Discord server yet, Please do and join the discussion there. All the data to reach us are in the description of our videos and the pinned comment. What you'll also find is the link tree of At The Writing Mage there, a fellow fantasy writer, author of the series Tales From The Wasteland, whose name is Mike Soldano, and also the links to Silver Compass Maps on social media, who are actually creating a map of Ruda at the moment. Also, you are always welcome to join our Patreon community, We currently have 22 loyal patrons who support us financially and are directly responsible for the better audio quality of the Treasure of Boneyard Bay. For example, with those earnings we bought a plug-in that made the conversations in grottos and dungeons sound a lot more immersive. And we were able to finish the project by having Ivan Dutch for the additional music. So thanks again, guys. You meant a lot to us for this project. You can support us for as little as $1 a month, and you'll get exclusive access to our Patreon content, a higher rank on Discord, and other benefits. Check it out on patreon.com slash audioepics and support audioepics before it gets cool. Don't forget to subscribe. Saying, oh, they're past 5,000 subscribers, they don't need an extra more, would be like saying, we already have four stories up now, we don't need another one. Which, of course, we do. So jump on that bandwagon so you can reach the notification bell up there. And if you thought the last episode was a bit long, well, I'm curious what you'll think of this one. You better take a quick toilet break, grab some snacks and a strong drink, perhaps a good piratey rum, because you'll need it. Here it is, the 11th episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. The Rescue It was a grey morning, and the sea was calm. Ludlov sat on the wreckage-strewn beach, surrounded by busy fishermen who mostly ignored him. He had learned quite a bit about the previous night just by listening to them. The large ship that had come to the Teresia's aid had turned out to be specifically designed to hunt down sea serpents, manned by a crew on the lookout for the great beasts. And yet, even there many harpoons had not managed to take down the mighty Tobalba. The sea serpent hunters had taken quite a few of the pirates on board and tasked them with retrieving Tobalba's corpse from the water. A monumental endeavor indeed, but the bone and meat of the creature would be quite valuable. Ludlov and Gustav, on the other hand, had been rescued by these local fishermen, who had also plucked a few nameless pirates from the water. The criminals had kept to themselves, remaining on one end of the boat, eyeing Ludlov and Gustav warily, but never approaching them. The fishermen had kept looking all night for other survivors, but never found any. When at last they had arrived in Boneyard Bay in the first light of dawn, there had already been a mass of curious onlookers gathered on the beach. Now their numbers had only swelled. From what he could hear, Ludlov surmised most of them wanted to learn more about how the infamous Tubalba 
had been destroyed after so many centuries. No one paid any particular attention to him or Gustav though, which was something of a relief. I found them, Ludlov! Gustav shouted while tapping his shoulder. Ludlov looked up. The others? he asked. Yes, they're close by. Ludlov immediately rose and followed the excited Flatlander. They were able to wade through the crowd fairly effortlessly. Ludlov himself became curious when he heard a familiar voice rising above the drum of a huddle of curious men and women. It's not ready to speak of it now. Leave the man be, please. It was Turmgard. Ludlov called out for him, but he couldn't be heard over the cacophony of voices. So Gustav took out his machete and used it to scare people away. Come on, out of the way if you don't want to feel anything sharp between your ribs, he shouted as he prodded the weapon among them. When the people began to scatter at last, the two men could make their way to the center of the throng, where they found the witch hunter, next to Blessed Zelenheim, both in a protective stance in front of Captain Brokelhoff, who was sitting on the sand of the beach, his face buried in his hands. Ludlov, Gustav, good to see you both, Tomgard said, shaking their hands. He was holding his witch hunter hat. Gustav must have retrieved it from the captain's quarters before the Teresia had sunk to the bottom of the ocean. He was not wearing it, though. Perhaps he wanted to keep a low profile for a while. Captain Brokelhoff remained where he was, but granted Ludlov and Gustav a nod of greeting. Goddess bless us, we have been reunited, the priestess said with a smile. Well, most of us, Gustav sighed. I know, Tomgard said. I saw what happened, what Alvarado did. By Saint Wilhelm's whiskers did that man die a hero's death. Ludlov's stomach twisted at those words, but thinking of his friend's sacrifice, he realized just how brave the young man had been. Amidst the unbearable pain of loss, he felt a glimmer of pride at Alvarado for what he had done. Who died a hero's death? What did he do? asked an old fisherman nearby. He was the last to remain after the other onlookers had dispersed and taken up scavenging the beach for wreckage from the Teresia. His skin was dry and tanned, his hair white and his dark eyes shone brightly. He spoke with a subtle Esclavian accent, but was clearly used to conversing in other languages, including Thotic. Our friend, Initiate Alvarado of the Witch Hunter Order of Seven Peaks. Born in Marnosa, former apprentice to the great Ferdinando Cuaron, Gustav told him. Spread the word so that all might know who defeated Tubalbar at last. The old man's eyes grew large. What did this initiate Alvarado do then? Gustav looked deep into the man's eyes and said, He gave his life by exploding Tubalbar's head with a barrel of gunpowder. The fisherman's mouth fell open in awe. That is a tale indeed. I will spread the word, all right? Ludlov found the whole conversation somewhat unsettling, but he knew in his heart how much Alvarado would have loved to become the subject of tales of grand adventure and heroic achievements. And he appreciated what Gustav was doing. Have you seen any sign of art or Cortignac? Ludlov asked, partly to change the subject and partly because he was worried about the pirates still looking for them. We believe they might still be on the sea serpent hunter ship, if they're both still alive, Blessed Zelenheim said. Eventually they will come look for us, I'm sure. They know they can't find... She looked around, suddenly realizing this was no place to talk about treasure. They know they need us, she concluded. Are you on the run from pirates? The old fisherman asked. I heard the name Cotignac. He is a well-known villain. Even the local pirate leaders fear him. Let's just say we would like to avoid their kind for now, Tomgard said. Can you help us hide from them? I can, but it will cost you, the fisherman said with a grin. 
We don't have much to offer, as you can see, Tomgard said. Ludlow took a sideways glance at Gustav's huge backpack. I do have a lot, but I'm not giving anything away if that's what you're thinking, the Flatlander said defensively. You have tales to tell, all of you, said the old fisherman with a smile. That's all I want. The old man agreed to take the traveling companions home immediately, expecting the story as payment. To Ludlow's surprise, the fisherman, who was apparently named Carlos, brought them to a stranded fishing boat at the edge of the town. It had been painted bright blue and turned into a pleasant abode containing a busy household. He introduced the treasure hunters to his daughter, Cristina, her husband, Antonio, and their children. Their daughter, Angela, eyed them shyly from a distance, while her little brothers, Alessan and Ruiz, were clearly very interested in their unexpected visitors. The family was exceptionally hospitable, and they made sure to take care of their guests before anything else. After supper, they all sat down to drink tea by a fire crackling in a large kettle in the middle of the room. Tomgard and Gustav took turns telling the story of their journey, with the others occasionally interrupting to offer an addition or correction. It was a good tale, Carlos concluded afterwards. You have more than earned your lodging. You killed that monster! Alessan exclaimed, looking in awe at Ludlow. His smaller brother echoed. I only took out one eye, he said. But it was enough to chase him away for a while. The true hero was... Suddenly, it stung too much even to mention his friend's name. And now Tubalbar is dead, and the terror of the Western Sea is gone, Carlos said, breaking the uneasy silence. Then that is one good outcome of our quest. It may turn out to be the only one, Ludlow muttered, fighting the heat behind his eyes, trying not to think of the cheerful eyes and silly jokes of the young Esclavian initiate. Good love, friend, Tom God said softly. I know Alvarado's death has hurt you more than any of us. Ludlow looked up, unsettled by the witch hunter's gentle tone. But he was ready and willing. He died a hero's death. He deserves to be celebrated. He does. Ludlow admitted, drumming his fingers on the table. Then he clutched the pouch of herbs that was still in his pocket. I should not mope. He would not have wanted that. He could barely utter the words, and in his heart he was fighting them even as he spoke. In truth, Alvarado had been too young, too bright, too hopeful and handsome, to have his life just snatched away before he could even reach the rank of witch hunter. He couldn't make sense of it, especially after losing Federhel and Chapelle as well. Ludlow knew he and the other remaining companions had no choice but to finish what they had started, but in his heart of hearts, he had lost the will to do so. He longed for his house in Seven Peaks, the house where he had lived his entire life. He had spent his youth there with his father. Later he had traveled around the continent, got married and moved back in with Maria. The house was tall and stately and could seem intimidating, but to Ludlow it was familiar. It gave him comfort to think of it. He had talked himself into this adventure, telling himself he had needed a fresh breath of air some time away from Seven Peaks. As he was gazing into the fire, he realized he had been right. He had made real friends. He had almost lost them all, but he was honored to have known every one of them. Now, however, Ludlow knew he couldn't lose any more of them. If Blessed Zelenheim Turmgard, Brokelhof, or Gustav were to die, 
it would be too much. I don't know why you have decided to come to Bonyard Bay, but most who travel this way do so for the treasure, Antonio told them, shaking good love out of his somber thoughts. We see adventurers passing through here all the time. You don't need to tell us your purposes, but if your tale is true, I believe you are the first to have a real chance of finding it. Perhaps the man was right. Ludlove had no idea how challenging this final part of the treasure hunt would be. He was convinced that they were on the right track, but in his heart he was torn between doubt and duty. How could any treasure be more important than the lives of Federhel, Chapelle and Alvarado? Now that they were so close, he almost hoped he had been wrong, and that the treasure wasn't buried beneath the statue of Sintrasha after all. Was it really worth the risk of even more death? Perhaps he was destined to soon join his friends in the afterlife. There was no guarantee he would be spared and somehow get back in one piece. Sitting back, he felt the figurine of the maiden in his pocket and took it out to look at it. How could the goddess have allowed so many young people to die over a pile of coins and jewelry? But as he looked upon her face, he remembered her own suffering at the hands of Lucus, and he knew ultimately he would find true comfort in her and nowhere else. The goddess, who loved every soul on Hruda, knew more than anyone what it was like to suffer loss. Her heart bled every day as she watched the men and women of this world. Rudloff cupped the statuette in his hands and looked at the people in the room. There was Gustav, who was rummaging through his backpack. Turmgard, who was absent-mindedly playing with a knife as he listened to Carlos talk about the local pirates. Blessed Zelenheim, drinking her tea. And Captain Brokelhoff, who looked as miserable and forlorn as Ludlov felt. When the Teresia had sunk, that man had truly lost everything. As he took in the captain's dull, haunted eyes, Ludlov decided he would fight to the end, no matter the result. Carlos was determined to keep on talking late into the night, but the companions were simply too tired. Eventually, Cristina convinced her father the travelers needed their rest and brought them to their quarters. It was a wooden hut next to the boat where fishing equipment was kept, but it had clearly been used for lodgings before. There were cots, nightstands and even some oil lanterns for late night reading, all amidst the fishing nets and anchors that were stored in the same room. Tomorrow morning, I will officiate a ceremony for Alvarado, Blessed Zelenheim said softly, as everyone was making ready to go to sleep. I will aid you if I may, Captain Brokelhoff told her, as he reverently took a bow that had been hanging on the wall, testing its strength. It was the first time he had spoken in hours. He looked into Ludlov's eyes. As Captain... I have the authority to declare him Leeuwenheld. It means a hero of Lioncrest, he explained. It's an honor very rarely bestowed. My father was the only Leeuwenheld I've ever known. Alvarado deserves it. Thank you, Captain, Ludlow said, trying to hold back his overwhelming grief. Then it will be so, the Captain said as he returned the bow to the wall and led back on his bedroll. Even in granting this kind gesture, the man's expression had been hollow and broken. Ludlov wished there was something he could do. Just then, Gustav began to rummage around in his backpack again. I almost forgot this, but your talk of lions made me remember, he muttered and then pulled out what looked like a heavy rag of deep crimson, with some gold thread sewn into it. It's a bit of sail from the Teresia, the Flatlander said, as he handed it over to Captain Brokelhoff, who sat upright to accept the torn cloth. I thought you might want this as a keepsake, Gustav added. The captain accepted it, held it in his hands and looked at it thoughtfully. 
Then he gently touched the gold thread that had once been part of the lion rampant depicted on the Teresia's glorious sails, and he wept. The Key It was dawn. The sun was still hidden behind the jungle-covered hills in the east, but the sky was alight with many colors. They were standing on the beach in a single row, looking out over the sea, as was the custom in such circumstances. Blessed Zelenheim stood in the middle of the group, Captain Brokelhoff beside her. The captain had the bow with him, along with a single arrow stuck in the sand before him. Carlos had insisted for him to take it as a gift. Blessed Zelenheim began the ceremony, commending Alvarado's soul to the goddess in lingua and blessing him on his journey to the light. Then she gave the captain the opportunity to grant the young Esclavian the posthumous title of Leonheld. Throughout it all, Ludlow heard Chappelle's song for Federhel in his mind. It brought back memories of her, of Federhel, and even of Master von Baumeister. And in that instant, he missed them all. After Alvarado's new title had been bestowed upon him, Captain Brokelhoff said, In order to consolidate the honor, the officer who grants it must give up a prized possession of his own, granting it to the sea. I only have one to give. Then he took the piece of sail from the Teresia and tied it to the arrow. Farewell, my love, he said, then drew the bow, aiming high and far. The arrow flew in a beautiful arc over the waves. The cloth raised up high once more, the colors of lion crest shining in the morning light. And then it dipped into the waters, never to be seen again. After a thoughtful silence, Blessed Zelenheim spoke again. which under Chapelle's feet is not known to us, and I will refrain from a liturgy for the dead, but I will bless her, wherever she may be. Ludlow thanked the priestess quietly, bowing his head and listening as the ancient rite of blessing was spoken. Farewell, Chapelle, he thought. The company returned to the houseboat to bid farewell to Carlos's family. Tomgard promised they would eventually be rewarded for their hospitality. The old fisherman laughed and said, <laughs> Consider it a gift, but if you do find the treasure, then you may reward us with a few coins. I could use some new nets. Tomgard nodded gratefully. He was wearing his witch hunter hat again evidently ready to complete their journey. Are you a witch hunter? Alison asked Tormgard, who simply nodded. His brother eagerly watched them. And you? Little Ruith demanded of Ludlov. He's more of a treasure hunter now, Gustav responded in his stead. You know, when all this is done, Ludlov said with a smile, I think I might become a pirate hunter. <laughs> The two boys giggled excitedly. Gustav was rearranging his backpack in preparation for the journey. It still amazed Ludlov how that man could fit all the items inside like a puzzle. 
The problem was that he had to unload the entire thing each time he needed something. While rummaging through it, Gustav came across the Sintrasha statuette he had bought on the market. He eyed it doubtfully, as if he was deciding again whether he should take it along or not. The eldest of the boys looked at the item in awe and boldly asked, Can I have that pretty lady? Gustav looked at him defensively, looking almost offended. But when he saw the light in the boy's eyes, he slowly handed over the statuette. The smallest boy looked at his older brother in awe, in disbelief that asking for it had actually worked to obtain it. Thank you, the older boy said, before running off with his little brother to play with it. The treasure hunters said their goodbyes to Antonio and Carlos, the only members of the family who were still to be found around the house, and started their trek in the direction of Queen Sintrasha's statue. The cliff where the statue stood was near. They ascended in single file, moving slowly and speaking little. The sun rose as they climbed the long, winding steps. When they arrived at the statue, everything looked exactly the same as the last time when Ludlow had been here. Except for his companions, he thought. Startled, as he realized that everyone who had been with him on his last visit to this statue was now dead. He looked around at his companions. Gustav and Turmgard had a look of fierce determination on their faces. Blessed Zelenheim seemed more apprehensive. Captain Brokelhoff was harder to read. Carlos's bow was still dangling from his belt although it was rather useless without any arrows. They all sat down to rest and enjoy the view before they would proceed with their quest. How are you doing, Captain? Ludlow asked gently. Better than before, the Lion Crester said. I miss my ship a great deal. I know it's hard for you to understand. Ludlow remained silent. He had never been a mariner or owned a ship, and indeed, the love such men held for their vessels puzzled him. But it was clear to him how much the Theresia had meant to her captain. But I'm beginning to understand, Brokelhoff continued, that a ship, no matter how grand, could never replace my wife. I was moving through this world in the illusion that she was still with me, through sail and timber, Ludlow. He shook his head at his own folly. She is with me, because she sees me, and she's waiting for me, up there, he said, pointing to the sky, and because I wait for her, and hold her, here, he concluded, pointing to his chest, and I will not allow grief to let my life go to waste. Ludlow laid his hand on the lion crest's shoulder. I'm glad to hear it, Captain. Well, you are right, Ludlov. Tomgard called out from near the statue. There are five niches with spikes in the base of the statue, and it looks like the pieces from the crown will fit. There are five of us, Gustav commented. Maybe we should each take one and insert them all at once. I don't think it's necessary, but it couldn't hurt either, I suppose, Tomgard granted clearly too tired to contradict the Flatlander. Gustav opened his backpack and began to pull out items from it to get to the box tucked in deep inside. One of the items he removed from the pack was the statuette of Sintrasha. He left all the items on the ground as he took out the box, too excited to wait any longer. Then he lifted the lid and distributed the golden cones among the companions. They arranged themselves in a circle around the statue, knelt down, and slowly placed the cones onto the spikes. They fit perfectly, but there was no mechanism that any of them could see, nothing that clicked into place. Are you sure this is all there is to it? Tomgard asked Bloodlov, who shrugged and looked around. He saw the statuette of Sintrasha, which Gustav had left lying on the ground, 
and suddenly realized something. It will not work, he said. All heads turned towards him in shock. Remember, it was your idea to return here, Ludlov, Gustav said in a warning tone. I mean, it, it will work, but we have to change something first, Ludlov clarified. Then he took hold of the statuette on the ground next to Gustav. Remember when you were convinced this was the key to the treasure, Gustav? The Flatlander shrugged. It was in a way. It was the key to the stone crown of Kulmaron, where we found the clue that led us to the temple on the island, where we found the actual crystal crown of Kulmaron, which you had to break in order to get the golden cones that now serve as the key to the real burial place. Simple enough. I think you were right from the beginning. It still serves as a key here, Ludlov said, pointing to the statue. Look, Sintrasha's arm is raised up towards the sea there. In the statuette, she's pointing down, which is incidentally where the treasure is buried. Gustav's eyes widened as he took in Ludlov's meaning. Oh, you mean we have to lower the arm of the statue? He gasped. Can we do that? Turmgard didn't waste any time on words and jumped up, grasping Sintrasha's arm and letting his full weight dangle there. At first nothing happened, but then there was the dry, rasping sound of rock and sand as the arm slowly hinged down, aided along by Turmgard's efforts. Eventually, there was a clicking sound, and the arm remained in place, pointing towards one of the indentations in the base below. That makes sense, Blessed Zelenheim said wryly. You're a genius, Ludlov, Gustav said. But don't tell anyone I said that. Just then, he noticed something shimmering below him. At first he thought it was the sunlight reflecting on the golden piece from the crown, but when he looked at it, he saw that the precious metal was emitting its own light. And not only his, but each of the five pieces began to glow. Then there came a rumbling sound from somewhere deep below the ground, which grew louder and louder. Suddenly, the hard, dry ground surrounding the base cracked and was overturned as the base burst free and began to rise up, carried by four thin pillars lifting the entire statue. Pebbles and dirt rained down from the sides of the stone as Sintrasha was raised up. Queen Sintrasha is still using her magic, Blessed Zelenheim said softly, even many centuries after her passing. Where the base had been was now a gaping hole, leading into the gloom below. A narrow staircase could be seen, spiraling down into the darkness. Something tells me this next trip underground will be different from our previous adventures on Garadoso, Gustav said. Better or worse? Captain Brokelhoff asked him. Gustav shrugged and began to return the items thrown about on the ground to his backpack. Last time, two of us were dead when we emerged, he said as he closed up the bag. I certainly hope this will not be worse than that. What do we do about the golden cones? Ludlov asked, looking up. Can we just leave them up there? Someone else might find them and take them, which might cause the statue to come down and close the door on us. That doesn't matter. The exit must be somewhere else or the treasure couldn't be moved, Gustav said. It's always that way. If someone finds this place like this, I think it more likely they would follow us down there, Tomgard said, pointing to the winding staircase leading into the darkness. Maybe one of us should stay behind then, Captain Brokelhoff offered, to guard the entrance. In the unlikely case those pirates show up here, whoever stays behind would be outnumbered and powerless against them, Ludlov said. No. I think we should stay together. I'm afraid we have no choice but to leave the statue up and the golden cones in their current position. Gustav waved his hand dismissively. Oh, who cares about a few golden cones if we're about to find the biggest treasure hoard in the world? I say we hurry. The more time we waste, the bigger the chance someone will see what happened to the statue.
No one could argue with that, and so they began their descent on the narrow stone steps winding down into the darkness. Gustav led the party, followed by Ludlov, Blessed Zelenheim, Captain Brokelhoff, and finally Tormgard. The only light they had came from the opening behind them. That was suddenly taken away from them when they were a bit lower. Someone's step, most likely Gustav's, activated some kind of mechanism or magic which caused the statue above to slide down into its original position before anyone could run back, leaving them in total darkness. This didn't last too long though, as a familiar glow illuminated the stairwell a little further down. I might be mistaken, but I believe that is the same glowing moss we encountered in the temple on Garadoso, Ludlov said. In the gloom, he perceived a movement of Gustav's head and took it for a nod. They proceeded in silence, soon finding themselves surrounded by the eerie beauty of the moss's cool glow. The stairwell went on for so long that eventually they believed they had descended beyond the cliffs, below sea level. Only then did the steps give way to a wide, cavernous tunnel. The ground was flat and wet, and between the stalactites and the moss also dangled long roots that reminded Ludlov of the tendrils of a jellyfish. What are those plants, Gustav? he asked. But even the self-styled botanist had no answer. If we don't know what it is, we don't touch it, Tomgard said. That sounds like a sensible rule down here, Ludlov agreed, remembering Alvarado's encounter with the snake on Garadoso. As they continued their walk, the environment began to change, slowly revealing more strangely beautiful plant life, much of which looked like it belonged underwater, but these growths seemed to be doing quite well in these caves. There were brightly colored corals, shaped like the antlers of a moose, growing like bushes out of the ground. Large, round pods, out of which came long appendages ending in luminous bulbs like lanterns hanging from tree branches. There were tall reeds, creeping lichen, and even flowers growing on the rocky walls. There was no need for torches or lanterns, as the plant life itself provided all the needed illumination. Varying in color between dabs of soft yellow and splashes of cool blue. This is the most beautiful place I've ever seen, Blessed Zelenheim said softly. The tunnel made a soft bend to the left, and it felt to Ludlov as if they were going downhill. The luminous flora remained omnipresent as they continued. A sense of anticipation grew in Ludlov's heart. They had felt close to the treasure on multiple occasions, but each time they had only discovered the next clue. Now it was different. It would truly not be long now. He felt it in his heart. Ludlov had never cared much for gold or fine jewels, but the thought of the sheer sense of discovery after all they had been through, made his heart soar with excitement. And then they came at a dead end. In front of them was a rocky wall, covered with glowing mushrooms and creeping parasite plants. Ludlov looked at Gustav, who stood with his arms crossed, rubbing his stubbly chin as if he was trying to solve another riddle. If there was one, Ludlov didn't see it. I hope this isn't why we came all this way, Captain Brokelhoff said apprehensively. Where's the gold? Tomgard grumbled. Blessed Zelenheim had a look of quiet desperation on her face. It's behind this wall, Gustav said. Of course it is, Tomgard said. It's behind the wall, down the tunnel, where there's a clue that reveals a puzzle that gives you a map that leads to yet another cave with another wall. Gustav ignored him. Of course, it's right there. He brushed aside some luminous lichen, revealing a niche in the wall 
that had clearly been carved by men. In the bottom of the niche was a star-shaped indentation. I knew it, he muttered. I really did have the key to the treasure all this time. Then he knelt down, took off his backpack, opened it and produced the statuette of Sint Russia once more. Ludlow saw the star-shaped base and nodded solemnly. We are about to unlock the way to the treasure, Tomgard, he said. I know it in my heart. The witch hunter remained silent and watched as Gustav reverently placed the statue in the niche. Should I turn it? Like a key? He wondered aloud. I mean, that's what Chappelle did back at those Kulmaron stones in the sea. Perhaps, Ludlow replied softly. With uncharacteristic reverence, Gustav took hold of the statuette and tried to turn it to the left, but he quickly found that it didn't move. Then he tried turning it to the right, which did work. As he did so, there was a series of clicking and rattling sounds reverberating through the cavern. Soon after, a deep rumbling sound began to rise up, until a portion of the wall to their right lowered into the ground with a grating roar, revealing another tunnel full of glowing plant life, spiraling down to the left at a steep angle. Ludlow proceeded to inspect the new opening. Some of the creeping plants still hung from the ceiling of the cavern, like a curtain between here and what lay beyond. There was more rattling as of gears turning, and Ludlow went back to the niche to see how the statuette slowly returned to its original position. In that moment, seeing Sintrasha framed in that niche, surrounded by luminous plants, he believed the statuette had at last arrived where it belonged. Should we leave it here? Ludlow wondered aloud. My key, Gustav protested. It came with me all this way. I know, it has grown dear to you. But when I see it, I think it has come home, Ludlow said. Perhaps it's time to let it go. The key is not the treasure itself, after all. Here, in these gloomy tunnels, Gustav said. But then he took another look, and by his changing expression, Ludlow guessed the Flatlander saw what he had seen. Reluctantly, Gustav nodded. He gently stroked the statuette's head as if it were a living being. Goodbye then, little Sintrasha. Then he joined Ludlow and the others into the tunnel. The Queen. The tunnel wound down like a staircase in a great round tower, and as they went, the sound of dripping water called to them from further on, reverberating through the cavernous depths. Then at last, the ground became flat once more, and the tunnel continued in a straight line. No one spoke as they walked the last small distance until their path opened up into a vast cave, large enough to fit in an entire village. Gustav, who had apparently been distracted on their way, was the last to enter the cave and take it all in. For the first time the Flatlander's mouth was wide open, but no sound emerged from it. Four massive columns each as wide as the wizard's mantle tree they had seen on Garadoso seemed to hold up the cave-like tent poles. Around them grew enormous vines, as thick as trees, sporting dark serrated leaves with luminous edges. There were thick bushes in the cave as well, with flowers as large as Ludlov's head. Mushrooms as tall as palm trees dotted the edges of the cave, their wide caps aglow. 
Incandescent dragonflies fluttered about the place, curiously exploring their surroundings. High above was a single shaft of sunlight from some crack in the rocks, probably too remote for anyone to have ever come across it. It shone down in the middle of the cavern, into a wide, clear pool. The water was shallow enough to wade through, which was immediately clear to all of them, since it was full of golden coins, shimmering like stars in the light of the sun and the luminescent flora that surrounded the pool. On the shores and strewn about the cave amidst all its natural splendor was the largest treasure hoard they could have ever imagined. Glittering coins of gold, gems in every color, necklaces, torques, statues and figurines of jade, ivory and obsidian, silver masks, diamond encrusted crowns and scepters, shining swords, shields and armor, so much treasure that the Teresia herself could never have carried it all. Ludlov wished he could have shared this moment with Alvarado. He knew his friend would have loved to set his eyes upon yet another legend on this journey. No one spoke. The glory of it all left them speechless. The five of them simply stood there, taking it all in. Then, after a prolonged silence, it was Gustav who said what they were all thinking. How are we ever going to get all of this treasure out of here? They could have left us some bags or barrels or something, Tuamgard said. Carefully, they stepped into the cave and explored it, spreading out across the area. Ludlov chose the right shore of the pond, feeling that he was going east, although he couldn't tell for sure. He saw a family of luminous snails crawling over one of the columns as he approached, and he almost stepped on a massive starfish that lay on the shores amidst the gold, lazily curling one of its limbs as if it were watching Ludlov with indifferent curiosity through its appendage. A little further on, he encountered a large urn. Thinking it might serve to collect at least some of the coins, he lifted its lid, only to find that it was already filled to the brim with rubies and emeralds. <laughs> he laughed, overwhelmed by the absurd wealth that surrounded him. I found something! Blessed Zelenheim called out from the other side of the pool. Unwilling to walk around again, Ludlov waded through the water towards the other side. As he crossed the shaft of sunlight, he enjoyed its natural warmth, which came as a pleasant diversion after spending so much time underground. When he arrived, he saw that the others had already followed the priestess past a curtain of vines into a cove. He hastened to catch up. When he entered the cove, he understood why she had summoned the others. The room was mostly empty, save for a massive slab of stone, resembling an altar at the far end. On top of it was another statue of Sintrasha, about half scale and depicted in a different way from what they had seen before. She held out her arms left and right, her palms open. To her right was a huge chest of ivory and gold. To her left was another one, equal in size, but far simpler of design and black as the soul of Lucus. Neither of the chests seemed to have anything like a lock or a keyhole. It's as if she's inviting us to make a choice, Ludlov said, causing the others to turn their heads in his direction. I believe you're right, Ludlov. The priestess said in a solemn voice, sounding as if she had a deeper understanding of what lay ahead. Well, if that's the case, it's simple enough, Gustav said. Gold and white is good, black is dark and evil. We choose the white chest. I don't know, Gustav. We shouldn't be too hasty, Ludlov said. The gold and ivory chest looks rather ornate, while the black one is very simple. I've heard it told in legends that the more humble choice is often the correct one. 
This is not a legend, Ludlov, Gustav said impatiently. If it isn't, it certainly does look like one, the captain interjected while looking around, prompting a shrug from the Flatlander. Shoot yourself, but I'm not touching that black chest. And you're right, Gustav, Tomgard said. That chest is made of black metal. Shocked, Ludlov turned to the witch hunter. Are you sure? I am. I have seen black metal before, and there is no question. This is the same material. Black metal was a deeply controversial topic within the Order. According to legend, it was out of this material that the devil Lucus had crafted the sickle with which he had murdered the daughter of the goddess. Still, some members of the Witch Hunter Order believed it could be used in their fight against illegal magic use, since it caused insufferable pain in anyone who tried to use the arcanic language while touching it. To Ludlov, that only confirmed its demonic nature. I would touch neither of these chests just yet, said Blessed Zelenheim. Let me sense whether there are any curses on them. Everyone stepped out of the way to let the priestess do her work. After all, what she was about to do was the very reason why she had suffered through all their dangers along with them so far. Ludlov and the others watched in silence as Blessed Zelenheim held her hands above both chests in turn, praying intensely over each of them. Her eyes closed. At last she turned to the group with a grave expression. What is it? Tormgard asked. They're not both cursed, are they? No, she replied. Neither of them is cursed. Unless it be a conditional curse. Ludlov wondered whether he ought to be relieved or disappointed. A conditional curse? Does that mean a curse that will only be activated under certain conditions? Indeed, and those are much harder to detect. They act more like guarding spells. They're more hidden, obscure, if that makes sense. A regular curse has hatred and malice behind it, easily sensible emotions. Blessed Zelenheim's explanation reminded Ludov of the discussions he had shared with Maria on magic and the goddess. The priestess sounded a lot like she could have been a magic user herself in this instance, which made sense. He reminded himself that even the Witch Hunter Order itself had its roots in the Arcanic tradition. And if there's a conditional curse, do you have any idea what sort of conditions might cause it to act out? Turmgard asked. Blessed Zelenheim shook her head. Perhaps this is the final test. Ludlov sighed. Of course, they could just ignore these chests and try to find a way out of these caves with the unspeakable wealth they had already found. But he knew that wasn't an option. The Queen of Oscorta was inviting them to partake in one last trial, and they simply couldn't ignore that. Besides, whatever item had been promised to Gustav was probably hidden in one of these chests. Thinking of the Flatlander's reward prompted Ludlov to ask him a question. Gustav, in which chest do you think the item might be found that was promised to you? The pretty bright one, of course. Did you think I was after something dark and evil? I thought as much, Ludlov said. In that case, we should probably just open that chest. It was a promise, after all. But then you assume Gustav is right. And the item he wants is actually in that white gold chest, Tomgard countered. That might be a trick in itself. We should ask for guidance, said the priestess. She knelt down and bowed her head, ready to start a prayer. But before she could utter a word, there was a flash of light, so bright it caused Ludlov to stagger back in shock. Disoriented, he looked around, but all he could see was white. Slowly, the gentle gloom of the cavern began to return. But at the far end, where the statue had been located, there was still a blur of bright light. 
He shielded his eyes but felt drawn to the shimmering white blur as well. Gently, the searing brightness subsided until it became a soft glow, revealing the figure of a woman clad in a white cloak. Her skin was a coppery tan and her hair was black, bound with a deep blue circlet in which a single bright star was set. There was a regal pride to her poise, but also gentle warmth in her gleaming dark eyes. Instinctively, Ludlov knelt and bowed his head as well, knowing he was in the presence of royalty. At last we meet, treasure hunters, said the apparition. I have long anticipated this moment. I have been with you throughout many dangers, though you did not know. Now, let us converse. Queen Sintrasha? Gustav said. Of course, brave Gustav, though I am no longer queen. Where I live, there is only one queen. Then you are a saint, gasped Blessed Zelenheim. When we return to Seven Peaks, I will petition the Cardinal for your canonization at once, Your Holiness. Sintrasha lifted a calming hand. Be at peace, blessed Zelenheim. For my sake, it is not needed. However, for the salvation of the Sintra people, my canonization in the Church of the Goddess could be an avenue of grace. I fear many of my people still mingle the forbidden arts with their faith in the Goddess. She is patient, but this cannot go on. Blessed Zelenheim nodded in understanding, but then she sighed. I have so many questions. I cannot answer them all, child, Sintrasha replied. I am not allowed to, and I come to you now for specific reasons. Then she looked kindly upon Gustav. I thank you, Gustav, for keeping me close to you. The statuette you carried was very special. Not only the key to this treasure, but also my eyes and ears in your world. You did well bringing it here. <laughs> Gustav gave her a shy, nervous laugh and bowed his head like Ludlov did. Now, hear my tale, all of you, Sintrasha continued. Everyone looked at her and listened intently. And as she spoke, it was as if time itself ceased to exist. After my departure from Skurta, I and those who followed me journeyed throughout the northern continent. Many of my followers sought refuge in Venendil, but others came with me as we traveled further south. I knew my treasure was too great for my people to keep. Such wealth would have corrupted us once more, as it had done in Oscurta. And yet, I knew that one day the treasure would be needed to help those in need. And so, over the years, I and my followers placed it here, keeping it hidden from the outside world with arcanic spells. We devised many trials so that only those worthy would one day find it and use it well. With the grace of the goddess, that time has now come. I ask you, Ludlov of Seven Peaks, why did you seek out this hoard? Ludlov was shocked that she had chosen to address him rather than Turmgard, who outranked him. We, we were sent here because our city is in need, your holiness. Plague and poverty have stricken it, and our people suffer. Indeed, and it is in your city that my people not well. You have taken the Sintra in over the years, and therefore I believe the gold should come to Seven Peaks, where it is not to be used for the pleasures of a few, but for the well-being of many, including my Sintra. Pardon me, Holy One, 
Gustav said rather irreverently. But I still wonder why your trial sent us all the way to Garadoso and back. Sintrasha smiled. The history of my people begins on Garadoso. They were once at the heart of the Mesopotamian civilization. A culture that was advanced for its time, but also cruel and harsh beyond measure. The Mesopotamians came under the rule of the sea demon Kulmarum, in the same way the Oskurtans would later be seduced by Ungravalden. Kulmaron was once lord over a great region, including all of Isclavia, but his influence there was lost to him ages ago, after the Isle of Slaves had submitted to the goddess. On Garadoso, however, he remained in charge through the power of his crown, even when all the inhabitants had died as a result of his cruelty. The crown also granted him authority over the souls of my people denying them access to the realm of the goddess. Only the destruction of that artifact could finally end his hold over the Sintra and the Ungra peoples. Unfortunately, those who had pledged themselves to Gulmaron could never destroy it, nor could any who descended from them, for the pledge lasts from generation to generation. Alas, for this reason, all of my people remained tied to him, including myself, it was the destruction of the crown that freed me, and finally gave me passage to the realm of the goddess. You have done this, and for that I am eternally grateful. Ludlov thought of Vedahel, and felt a glow of consolation in his heart, knowing that the gentle initiate's final act of bravery had brought about the salvation of countless souls. So it was you who placed those trials in the temple. Tumgard said. The temple of Kulmaron was already full of traps and dangers, built by my ancestors, Sintrasha said. My followers and I used what they had made to construct our trials. We were also the ones who hid the crown in the temple and placed Krenkor on the shores of Garadoso to judge the hearts of those who would set foot on the island. Only those who would not keep the crown for themselves were allowed entry. Only the worthy would pass the trials and destroy the crown. That single act also made you worthy to find the treasure here in Boneyard Bay. And now you have arrived. Her eyes went over them as if she were judging each of them in turn. At last, she smiled at Gustav. You wish to know which chest you need to take with you, don't you? Well, yes, holy lady, if it's not too much trouble, the shopkeeper admitted. The white gold chest can only be unlocked by a holy cleric of the goddess, Sintrasha said, if there are any left in the world. True holiness is rare, especially among those who carry great responsibility. Everyone looked at Blessed Zelenheim, who bowed her head in deference. If Blessed Zelenheim can open this chest, you will have proven your word as a group. Everyone was silent as the priestess approached the chest as if she intuitively knew what to do. She looked at it, laid her hands on the lid, and closed her eyes. Then she took a deep breath and looked the apparition of Sintrasha in the eye. It seemed to Ludlov as if there was a wordless conversation between the two women, and they understood one another in a way he couldn't quite fathom. Then the blessed Zelenheim lifted the lid of the chest with the same ease she would open her own personal box of belongings. He could only catch a glimpse of what was inside. Gustav stretched his neck to see more, but managed to resist the urge to do anything more than that. The chest is unlocked, Sintrasha said simply. Now anyone can open it. Be careful, therefore, in discerning whom you allow to touch it. 
What would you have us do with this chest, my lady? Blessed Zelenheim asked. Take it to Seven Peaks, Sintrasha answered. There, I only ask that it will be put to good use, and in particular to serve the needs of the Sintra people. If the heirs of Wolfen ever betray their duty to protect my people, nothing will guard the city of Seven Peaks against evil anymore. Not even the sacred stones? Tomgard asked. Rudlov's heart skipped a beat. Here was a saint from heaven who might at last divulge the truth about the stones, a topic on which he had written. Nothing will protect the city then, she repeated. I am not able to say more, for it is outside of my influence. My knowledge is limited. Ludlow felt somewhat vindicated by that response, but he was disappointed that he still didn't know anything more. Why would the sacred stones be insufficient to protect Seven Peaks? Was it because their power had nearly been drained, or because they had never had any power to begin with? There was still no answer. As for the black chest, Sintrasha continued, regarding the dark item with some apprehension. That too can only be opened by a holy one. In this case, it is the holy one's blood that must be spilled over it. For it is protected by dark magic, and only murder will suffice to break the spell. This chest belonged to Plinius Novacula. We hid it here with the treasure, because it could not be destroyed, and it should never fall into the wrong hands. We stored it here, believing that those worthy of the wealth of our people would also handle Novacula's chest wisely. The true finder will have to take both chests along. It is the only way to leave this cave. That thing should certainly not fall into the pirates' hands. That's as clear as daylight, Tormgard said. We will take it along and lock it up safely with the other artifacts in the vaults in Seven Peaks. I trust you will guard the dark secrets and forbidden knowledge of Plinius Novacula with your lives, the apparition of Sintrasha said. Blessed Zelenheim gave her a terrified look. Do not fear, Blessed Zelenheim. The chest will also remain closed to anyone except Plinius Novacula himself. Then it will never be opened, Ludlov said, for Novacula died many centuries ago. Sintrasha's gaze into his eyes made him feel small, and he had to fight the urge to look away. Novacula was the greatest dark sorcerer who ever lived, she said and he had discovered a great and terrible secret. There was a look of faraway terror deep in her eyes now, as if she was remembering some great atrocity. Novacula learned to migrate his soul after death, to take possession of another body, far away. He has done this many times throughout the ages. Before he was Novacula, he was another man. And after Novacula's death, he became another one still. He may yet still roam your mortal world, cloaking his identity with dark magic. The implications of what she had been saying startled Ludlov. He imagined some dreadful sorcerer figure wandering through the wilds, gathering more and more dark power to himself over the centuries in ancient and forbidden places. If such magic existed, the world was an even more frightening place than he had thought. Then suddenly, he was reminded of Chapelle again and what she had found in the Bodwag forest. Maybe Novacula was somehow attached to that place. He thought about sharing his insight with her, but then it dawned on him again that she was not with him anymore. You have suffered much to come here. The apparition said, looking at them all with great compassion. The friends you have lost will soon meet with me as well. And after that, 
A greater adventure awaits them than any on the world of Ruda. Ludlow thought of Vedahel, Chapelle, and Alvarado, and wondered how it would be if he could join them. Not yet, he thought. I may yet be of some use here. Now I entrust the treasure of Boneyard Bay to your care, Sintrasha said, stretching her arms with her palms open just like her statue. Use it well. And with those words, the apparition disappeared. Even in spite of all the luminescent flora, the cave seemed much darker to Ludlow now, and he felt ready to leave this place behind. Let us honor St. Russia's wishes, Blessed Zelenheim said. We should first take the white gold chest with us when we leave. Well then, let's pick up these chests and head out of here, Tomgard said, as he moved to the white gold chest and tried to lift it, <coughs> quickly discovering it was too heavy for him. <sighs> I don't know where you plan to take that thing, Gustav said, but I'll help you lift it if you like. Turmgard didn't respond to the Flatlander, and just waited for him to lift the other side. <sighs> this is ridiculously heavy, Gustav panted after an initial attempt. We need four men, or maybe we could take some items out to make it lighter, he suggested, unable to hide his eagerness to take a peek inside. Lord Adomir clearly instructed to deliver any treasure chests unopened. Don't worry, shopkeeper. You'll get your little trinket if it's in there. So, Witch Hunter, a promise is a promise, Tomgard reassured him. Gustav nodded in understanding. Wordlessly, Ludlov and Brokelhoff joined him and Tomgard, each of them pulling at a corner of the chest. Once they had finally managed to lift it slightly from the slab, they noticed it had been resting on a pressure plate, which began to rise up. Simultaneously, a hidden doorway began to open up behind the stone slab with the now familiar dull rumble, revealing another gloomy tunnel. That's where we take it! Tomgard cried out. The doorway stopped moving once it had opened up to the height of Ludlov's waist. That's a problem, Tomgard admitted. No worries, Brekelhoff said. Remember what the host said. You need to lift both chests to get out of here. Let's move the black one as well. They handled the black chest with a little more apprehension. It proved to be lighter than its counterpart and was more easily lifted. The doorway opened up all the way now and they were able to move ahead into the tunnel. Let's leave the black chest here for now, Tomgard said. I think the white gold one is most important, so let's take it with us first. I think it's all a bit too easy, Gustav muttered. We find the treasure, a pretty lady shows up to congratulate us, and then we just go home for some cake and medals from the mayor? Would you prefer it if some horrid monster appeared to bite off your fingers, chew on your bones and suck out your eyes? Tomgard asked. Not particularly, Gustav admitted in a small voice. I, for one, welcome the thought of returning home, Ludlow said. I know how you feel, Captain Brekelhoff said, even though I don't know where home is anymore. Tunnel. This tunnel is not as nice as the previous ones, Gustav said as they made their way through the gloom. The four men carried the chest, the priestess walking beside them. Ludlov looked around. The Flatlander was right. The luminescent plant life was limited to vein-like lichen creeping along the wall, providing a glow only just bright enough to see where they were going. They followed the pathway as it gradually sloped down, pausing many times along the way to set the chest down and take a breath. Eventually, Blessed Zelenheim began to lag a bit behind, and when Ludlov turned to take a look at her, 
it was clear she was simply exhausted. Perhaps the journey was taking its toll on her, or perhaps her interactions with the chest had somehow drained her. Occasionally, he caught her wincing and looking around in fear. What's wrong? he asked eventually. I think I heard something. Did you? she asked, her eyes wide with distress. Ludlow hadn't heard anything. It could be anything. Who knows what sort of things live in a place like this? Gustav said. You're not exactly reassuring her, Flatlander, Tomgard remarked. We've still got our weapons. If a giant cave rat or a throttling snake tries to bother us, we'll be prepared. Do those exist in places like this? Zelenheim asked. You know a bit about that sort of thing, don't you, Gustav? Um, no, Gustav said after a pause. Of course not. It was just a figure of speech. A bit further on, Ludlov heard the sound as well. Something seemed to be scratching at the rocks. He decided not to mention it, but he noticed the other three men quickened their pace as well. The road through this tunnel was longer and more arduous than they had expected. As they continued, the air became more moist and the taste of salt landed on their lips. They had to be close to the sea. Just when Ludlov was about to suggest another rest, he saw they had reached a dead end. Even the luminous creepers had thinned to the point where it took some squinting to make out their surroundings. But it was impossible to miss the wall in front of them. No! Tomgard panted as they lowered the chest. Not another dead end. This is the last one. I'm sure of it, Gustav said. I can smell the sea. Ludlov was about to comment on the Flatlander's relentless optimism, but then he had to admit the man was right. They were almost out of this goddess-forsaken place. He thought of Federhel, who had had a sense for these things and would probably have been able to confirm if the sea was actually near. Instinctively, he began to inspect his surroundings, feeling the wall in front of him. It was wet and slippery, overgrown with moss. Then he looked to the right, and in the sad remnant of light that was left to them, he thought he saw a large steering wheel with a skull carved into the middle. Inspecting it from a bit closer, Ludlow saw that it had a heavy chain attached to it, which ran diagonally upwards and disappeared in a hole in the cave. He turned to face the others. I think I found it, he said. Tomgard approached and looked at the wheel. It's just like the entrance to the temple on Garadoso. He took a deep breath and then grasped two of the handles. Santa Agnes, let this be the last doorway mechanism we ever have to face. Together they pulled. <sighs> it took some effort before the chain began to move, but eventually it came out of the wall and began to wrap around the wheel. Gustav and Brokelhoff had found a similar mechanism on the other side and were turning their wheel as well. Slowly but surely, the wall in front of them began to rise up, and a dim light crept through underneath. Ludlow couldn't resist the urge to bend down and look at what lay ahead. He saw a large cave, but at the end of it was bright daylight. And in the distance beyond, he could vaguely make out the shape of something enormous. When the wall had finally risen all the way to the top and the noise of rattling chains and grinding stone had stopped, Ludlov realized that the huge shape in the distance beyond the mouth of the cave was a ship resting in the water. The cave itself opened up into a beach and its floor was soft with wet sand. There were also many rocks and boulders spread out throughout the cave and for a moment Ludlov thought he saw huddled shapes of men sitting there, waiting in silence. I think this is Skullcrest Cave, Captain Brokelhoff said. Do you mean the cave where I told the pirates they would find the treasure? Tomgard said. Well, that's uncanny, he muttered to himself. The sound of scratching returned behind them 
but Tomgard and Gustav refused to pay any heed to it, too excited to finally face the daylight with a treasure chest in their hands. Both of them began to walk into the cave. Reluctantly, Ludlow followed them, with Brokelhoff and Zelenheim close behind him, leaving the chest behind. You know, I thought I saw shapes of men here, Brokelhoff said, echoing Ludlow's own thoughts. Gustav and Tomgard stopped to look around. Figures began to rise up from behind boulders and stalagmites, brandishing cutlasses and pistols. <sighs> Pirates, Ludlow said with a sigh. Of course. The Beach Ludlow wished he had time to think, but he only had time to react. They weren't far into the cave yet, and most of the pirates were still some distance away. But that was changing fast. Some came crawling up, drawing pistols or swords. Others were already moving, their cutlasses raised. Gustav tried to dash back to the tunnel, but Ludlow pulled him down as he ducked for cover himself. They only just avoided a pistol shot from one of the pirates. Don't go back! They'll have us trapped, Ludlow told the Flatlander. It would be a massacre in there. Tomgard was already locked in combat with a sword-wielding pirate. Brokelhoff and the priestess were hiding behind a large boulder. Ludlow and Gustav remained exposed where they were. Looking for a place to hide, Ludlow saw how Tomgard had managed to kick the attacking pirate into two other approaching ones causing the three of them to tumble on top of each other. Still, so many more enemies came his way that Tomgard had no other choice but to turn and flee back towards the passageway. Ludlow feared for him, but he had no time to think now. Crawling through the wet sand on their bellies, he and Gustav managed to find a large boulder to hide behind. Ludlow quickly looked over the edge to see what was happening to Tomgard. A pirate had thrown an axe at him which the witch hunter had managed to avoid by falling to the ground. Just then, a huge, white spider-like creature, almost as tall as a man, with legs like swords, came jumping out of the blackness over Tormgard, catching the axe blade in the middle of its ugly head. The monster fell over, dying with a shriek as it landed between the witch hunter and the pirates. Ludlow saw Tormgard crawling upright and disappearing back into the gloomy tunnel. The pursuing pirates stopped dead in their tracks right before the entrance, refusing to go any further. The scratching sounds they had heard before returned, only much louder this time, causing terrified screams from the pirates. Then there was a bone-chilling scream that emerged out of the darkness. Ludlow guessed it had been Tormgard's voice. A moment later, at least six or seven of the enormous spider-like creatures came rushing out of the gloom. They were almost as tall as a man, with eight malevolent eyes bulging out of their misshapen heads. Their pale, hairless bodies were thick and covered with warts and pustules. Their long legs were unlike those of any spider Ludlow had ever seen, each of them a huge scythe-like blade from the knee down. Those things could easily tear through a Dugarum's torso by the look of them. The creatures scuttled over the cave ceiling and the wet sand at a terrifying speed. Ludlow saw how one of the spiders dropped down from the cave ceiling, piercing two pirates at once with its blades. A sharp appendage of some sort emerged out of its bloated, sagging thorax and immediately began to suck out all the fluids of its first victim. By the sound of it, many more of these spiders were coming out of the tunnel behind them. A quick scan of the cave showed Ludlow that the creature's interest was drawn by those men who moved either towards or away from them but they ran right past the few pirates who simply stood frozen in fear. Tunnel slicers! Gustav cried out. Tunnels! These are tunnels! Unwilling to alert the enemy, Ludlow covered the Flatlander's mouth with the palm of his hand, ignoring his frantic, muffled cries. <laughs> Pistol shots were fired into the heads of the monsters, causing yellowish blood to burst out. Other pirates slashed at the legs above the knees, some managing to slice them off. Not all combatants were as effective, though. Those who attacked the spider's blade legs were easily parried and then killed, and those who ran were rarely fast enough. 
Within the blink of an eye, the cave had become a battlefield of pirates and tunnel slices, as the creatures were apparently called. Hoodlove had a gut feeling it was better to stand down and keep a low profile. For all he knew, the creatures followed wherever there was movement. He slowly tried to reach Federhell's pistol without drawing too much attention, but as he looked down he remembered he didn't have any gunpowder. He had noticed it earlier underground and had wanted to refill, but after their encounter with Sintrasha, he had completely forgotten about it. Von Baumeister would definitely have told him that such negligence would have negatively influenced his evaluation. Although he wasn't sure it would make a difference, he readied his rapier instead. Gustav, who had sensed his preoccupation with his gear, suddenly bit down on Rudolf's palm, causing him to jerk his hand away reactively. Blisters! The Flatlander cried out, and off he ran, spraying sand behind him as he dashed headlong towards the pirates. Rudolf saw how Blessed Zelenheim had recognized the code word and left her hiding place as well, quickly followed by Brokohoff. Blisters it was then, Rudolf thought, and he darted for the exit as fast as he could. As he was running towards the daylight, a pirate jumped in front of him, swinging a cutlass to behead him, only to be cut down himself by a tunnel slicer before he could hit Ludlow. Ludlow let the creature enjoy its meal and simply ran past it as fast as he could, but the soft sand underneath his feet seemed to be actively opposing his escape. Shriveled corpses and bloody limbs lay strewn about the ground as he passed. Some of the dead pirates looked vaguely familiar from the time he had spent in captivity aboard the Theresia. In front of him, Gustav was moving at a speed Ludlow had never expected from the rotund shopkeeper, especially with all of that luggage still on his back. Behind him, he heard horrible noises of death and carnage, but all he could think of was his need to get out of this living nightmare. Finally, he reached the mouth of the cave, but he kept on running, fearing both the creatures and the pirates. The beach was fast, spreading out left, right and in front of him. The ship that lay anchored in the sea was equally enormous, larger and more opulent than the Theresia, and it was flying the pirate flag. The Pirate Lord, Ludlow realized. Gustav stopped running and just stood there, in the middle of the beach, panting as he looked ahead. Ludlow joined his side. His heart sank. A dozen rowboats carrying vicious-looking pirates were making their way across the waves towards the beach. And even to the left and right, Ludlow saw scores of the thugs approaching. He had never seen so many pirates in one place. Gustav fell on his knees, raising his arms in despair. Brokelhoff and the priestess joined Ludlow and Gustav, all drawing their weapons and standing back to back. It was hopeless, of course. They were outnumbered by 20 to 1 or more. Even if the tunnel slicers were to emerge from the cave and attack the pirates while leaving Ludlow and his friends alone, they wouldn't stand a chance. And it looked like those creatures shunned direct daylight, since they were nowhere in sight. As the enemies drew nearer, Ludlow wondered where Tormgard was. Had he been killed by the tunnel slicers as well? As we near the end of life, dear goddess, have mercy. Blessed Zelenheim said softly, holding Chapelle's blade ready. Bless us in our final hour, and grant us in thy infinite kindness what no soul can deserve. Thy final embrace. The pirates were all around them now, enclosing them like a pack of wolves surrounding a tiny huddle of lost sheep. The four of them stood in a small circle, with enemies in every direction. Any last words? asked a burly, bearded pirate as he raised his pistol at them. Don't shoot us, please! Gustav cried out. <laughs> the big man chuckled darkly. Funny that. Same last words as the last man I shot. Then a shot resounded in the air. However, it hadn't come from their assailant. Someone else had fired a pistol. Stop! cried a voice, and several of the pirates made way as someone important was clearing a path towards the fort. Ludlow's stomach turned as Ard appeared in front of them, wearing his familiar grin. These maggots are mine to kill. It would be a waste to grant them a quick death. 
Oh no! <laughs> he swaggered intimidatingly close to Ludlow, looking into his eyes. They deserve special treatment. Ludlow responded to Art's grin with an icy stare. He wouldn't give this scum the satisfaction of seeing his fear and anger. Ard's expression turned more grim the longer he held Ludlow's gaze. Eventually, the pirate looked away and addressed them as a group. Throw down your weapons, or this will be a very brief conversation. They all looked at each other. I won't ask twice, Ard warned. Reluctantly, Ludlow was the first to throw his blade into the sand followed by his pistol, the last keepsake he had of Federhel. Brokelhoff and the others followed his example in the painful knowledge that they had no other choice. Ard nodded approvingly, and two of the pirates stepped forward to pick up the fallen weapons, then returned to the others. Where is the last one? Ard asked Gustav, who looked like he wasn't planning to respond. There were supposed to be five of you. Yeah, boys. Some voices shouted from behind Ludlow's back. Turning around, he saw how two pirates shoved Turmgard out into the open circle where the other companion stood. <laughs> Ludlow was both relieved and shocked at the same time. At least Turmgard was still alive, but barely so, it seemed. He was covered in grime and blood, much of which had to be his own. There were large gashes in his clothes where he had been slashed either by pirate weapons or by the tunnel slicers. Good! Ard said as Tormgard joined the others. One happy family. Now, where is the chest? We think it's in the cave, boss, said one of the same pirates who had returned Tormgard to the group. But we've already lost a score of men in there. <laughs> what? Ard scoffed. Don't tell me you're so pathetic that you let these five deck swabs kill twenty of you. They didn't, boss. The spiders did it. Really big ones. They're called tunnel slicers, Gustav commented. That incorrigible man, Ludov thought. Ard casually slapped Gustav across the face as he stepped closer to the pirate who had spoken. All right then, but now those things are all dead. Most are dead. Others fled back into the tunnel. There's a tunnel? Ard asked. Aye, boss. In the back of the cave. That's where these maggots came from. We think the chest is in there. Good, that's all I care about. Take a dozen men and go fetch it. And make sure at least six of you survive to carry it. It only took four of us, grumbled Captain Brokelhoff. You can't take the chest, Gustav cried out. If we return to Seven Peaks empty-handed, the mayor will pin my head to the wall of his study. Ard laughed heartily, <laughs> as if Gustav was a good friend of his who had just told him a fine joke. Ah. Then he slapped his fellow Flatlander on the back. Well then, <laughs> you're lucky I'm a decent fellow, aren't you? You don't have to return to Seven Peaks at all and I'll happily pin you to one of our masts before that mayor of yours can lay a hand on you. You're welcome, by the way. In the meantime, the pirates had chosen a group of twelve who were now drawing their weapons and preparing to make their way back to the cave. Ard's attention returned to his remaining crew. Take them on board, he said with a nod to Ludlow and his friends. Rough hands grasped them and shoved them in the direction of the rowboat lying on the wet sand ahead. By the justice of the goddess, you will not get away with this. Bessard Zelenheim hissed in a voice Ludlow had never heard from her before as one of the pirates grabbed her. The man barked a laugh, then sniffed her hair like a dog. Why don't you pray me to death then? He said with a yellow toothed grin. Ludlow could almost smell his breath from five feet away. Aren't you religious folks supposed to be all radiant with joy? Or do you need some help with that? Fancy a tickle with me knife, do you, priestess? Ard laughed again. <laughs> Ludlow feared where this was going. If only he could take out the pirate guarding him, and then one of those holding their weapons. 
he would have to distract them somehow. Where did you all come from? he asked Ad. There are more of you now than there were on the Teresia, before Tubalba ate almost your entire crew. Gustav gave Ludlov a quick and furtive glance, but it was clear he had understood what he was trying to do. They're like roaches, Ludlov, he said. Whenever you think you've got them all squashed, they come back and bring a whole bunch of their rotten little mates. He was rewarded for his remark with a hard punch in the gut. <coughs> oh. Ad said something to Gustav in Flatlandish that Ludlov didn't understand. <coughs> but the tone of it was clear enough. The pirates took away Gustav's backpack and felt each of them for any hidden weapons. As they did so, a scrawny fellow with mean little eyes found the figurine of the maiden, which Ludlov still had with him. Look here, lads. Here's a secret weapon for ya, the sailor said, inviting laughter from his friends. What's this then, eh? he asked Ludlov. Something to keep you company on lonely nights? There will be many of those ahead of him, Ad said. Let him keep it. I'm sure it will prove less trouble than that girlfriend of his we sent to the sharks. <laughs> More laughter. <laughs> the companions were bound with ropes and marched across the beach with lots of shoving, mocking and threatening talk. Then they were forced to take place in the rowboats. We will continue our conversation on board the Scorcher, Ad said. Ludlov sat with Gustav and the priestess. The burly pirate who had threatened them on the beach would be doing the rowing. Captain Brokelhoff and Turmgard were put in another boat, with Art for company. Ludlov didn't envy them. Whose ship is that? Ludlov asked the pirate, as they were making their way across the waves to the enormous galleon moored in the sea. Afraid he already knew the answer. You've never heard of the Scorcher? The pirate asked, like he could hardly believe that. Is this the pirate lord's personal vessel? Ludlov asked. The rower didn't say anything. He just looked at him with a vicious smirk. The Viper Ludlov remembered the stories he had heard of the pirate lord of Torgusan. He believed that many of the other captains were under his thumb and paid him tribute. However, some of the tales were clearly embellished with exaggerated myths, such as the terrible beast that this great leader supposedly kept as a pet, and his personal cavalry of gorehound riders. Still, the pirate lord was undoubtedly a grim and dangerous figure. The lavish ship where Ludlov was brought aboard provided some evidence of that. It was entirely black, like Kotignac's ship had been, but unlike the previous pirate vessel he had seen, this one had gilded decorations everywhere, all of them in a macabre style. A lacquered wood carving of two skeletons bearing scythes framed the door to the captain's quarters and there were lanterns attached to the masts held by bronze claws with long nails. Pleasant fellow, this pirate lord must be. Ludlov quietly commented to Gustav and the priestess as they were shoved to the main mast. His companions from the other boat joined them soon after. A few men were put on guard with the party while the other pirates went about their business. Even Ard ignored them for what felt like a very long time. Eventually there was some commotion as another rowboat arrived, bringing the white gold chest. It was hauled on board with considerable effort and eventually put in the middle of the deck, in front of Ard, who licked his lips as he approached it. Did you have any trouble getting it? He asked the pirates who had brought the chest. Henri and Victor became spider lunch, grumbled one of the men with a shrug. But we drove those beasties back into the tunnel. Small price to pay then, Ard said. Then he lifted the lid and looked inside. Ludlov shared a worried glance with Blessed Zelenheim. Ever since she had unlocked it, even as vile a man as Ard could open the chest. He could see the regret in her eyes. 
Shouldn't we be waiting for Cotton Yak? said the scrawny fellow who had mocked Ludlow's maiden figurine. He's running an errand for El Padre, Ard said, evidently irritated by the remark. He left me in charge while we wait for him, so we might as well take a peek at what we're about to share. So, Cotton Yak was not only alive, but he still outranked the ambitious Ard, Ludlow noted to himself. Ard lifted a string of pearls from the chest and played with the beads between his fingers. That would look good on me, ma'am, said the thin pirate. Anything that generated you couldn't look good with all the most valuable jewels in the world on it, Derek. <laughs> Ard's comment invited chuckles from his friends. Except for Derek. Ludlow wished he could break free and give these men a piece of his mind as they took turns taking out precious items, all of them of tremendous historical as well as monetary value. They played with them as if they were children's toys. One of the pirates pranced around with a painted fan depicting the gardens of Oscorta, pretending to be a court lady venturing outside on a summer's day. Two others were having a mock duel with jewel-encrusted knives. They might have been letter openers, if such things existed back in Sintrasha's time. Ard inspected a fine silver goblet, then threw it back in the chest and rummaged around in it a bit more. Even Gustav seemed disgusted at their careless behavior. Then his eyes grew wide with shock as Ard lifted a small pouch hanging from a silver chain. It was made of black silk and had a mysterious symbol embroidered upon it in silver thread. Ard had noticed Gustav's reaction and grinned in his direction. So, this must be the little trinket that was promised to you then, he said. I hope you realize now that von Baumeister was never going to give it to you. And since you won't be alive for much longer, I'll just consider it part of my inheritance. Ad hung the chain around his neck, proudly displaying the pouch on his chest. You wouldn't leave your best friend and favorite countryman out of your last will and testament, would you? He added with wide, innocent eyes. By this time, the laughter of the other pirates had begun to strike Ludlow as somewhat forced and sycophantic, indicating that Ard's high status among them would not last forever. These men accepted the Flatlander as their leader for now, but they didn't really look up to him. Cotignac's position remained unchallenged, and it would be wise for Ard to keep it that way for now. Ludlov looked away, no longer able to stomach the mistreatment of the ancient treasure. As he turned his gaze towards the sea, he saw a colossal galleon, even more impressive than the Scorcher, sailing by in the distance. He sighed inwardly. If only he could ask for help with the people aboard that vessel somehow. Then again, he supposed most travelers near this den of villainy were more likely to rob or murder those in need than to help them. The pirates paid no heed to the other ship in any case. Even when it turned in their direction and began to approach the beach, they were too busy looking at the treasure, drinking, laughing or gambling to care. Eventually, they put all of the items back in the chest and Ard closed the lid. He quickly slid the pouch around his neck underneath his shirt. We'll decide how to divide the loot as soon as Cotignac returns, he said with a smile that seemed almost genuine. Now, Derek, he went on as he locked eyes with Gustav. What do you think? Should we clear the deck of vermin before our captain arrives? It'd be the polite thing to do, for sure, Derek said with a toothy grin. Ard nodded as he appraised the group. Very well then, Derek. Since you're the bard of our clan, which one of these pests would get a eulogy from you first? Derek, who didn't strike Ludlow as the literary type at all, took out his dagger and recited a rhyme as he pointed at each of the five companions in turn. Toad or roach, worm or rat, each of you will soon be flat. With a slash or a bite, or the shot of a gun, 
death by our hands will quickly be done. He ended the rather pathetic rhyme with his blade pointed at Blessed Zeelenheim, then shrugged. Seems to me like the bird is first to go. All right, Ard said. Bus! A stocky, angry-looking man with bulging muscles on his tattooed arms looked in Ard's direction. You look like you could do with a kill. I'll give you a nice shiny priestess in a moment. How would that be? Thanks, Ard. Bus said, as if he had been offered a drink. The Flatlander drew his knife. But first, I need to express myself a bit. Derek's poetry has inspired my creative side. He nodded to Blessed Zeelenheim and watched in glee as Bus grabbed her by her hair and shoved her in front of him. Smiling at her, Ard softly turned his blade on his fingertip and held his head askew as if he were an artist wondering how he would approach the subject. I think I'll make a funny drawing. Experience has taught me women love that sort of thing. How about I draw you something body blessed? <laughs> I'm sure you'll secretly treasure it for the rest of your life. The priestess tensed but remained quiet as Bas tightened his grip and Ard came very close to her. With one hand, he held her chin in a firm grasp. With the other, he had his knife ready. Ludlov couldn't help himself and made a vain attempt to wrest himself free of the rope tying his hands together. The hand of an unseen pirate held him in check and he could only watch as Ard traced an upwards curved line in the air, like an artist in rehearsal of what he was about to do to Blessed Zeelenheim's face. She closed her eyes, preparing to undergo Ard's diabolical routine. Ludlov forced himself to keep watching. He wouldn't let her go through this horror alone. Ard! A voice screamed from the crow's nest directly above. What? Ard reacted, annoyed at being disturbed. It's now! It was a deafening boom and a massive impact as a cannonball was fired directly into the hull. Ludlov looked towards the sea again. The enormous ship that was approaching had bright red sails, gilded railings and a huge cannon mounted on the bow, right above the intricate and impressive figurehead depicting a winged and armoured angel bearing aloft a flaming sword. Smoke rose from the cannon and the ship slowly turned to sail parallel with the scorcher, revealing two rows of broadside cannons. The pirates screamed in panic, running around and looking for weapons or hiding as crossbows and rifles were fired from the deck of the other ship. The man in the crow's nest of the scorcher was hit by a crossbow bolt and came crashing down onto the deck. Blisters! Gustav cried out, jumping out of the way. Ludlov saw how Blessed Zeelenheim escaped Bus's grasp and let herself fall onto the deck. Ard was already out of sight. Running to the railing, his hand still tied to his back, Ludlov's heart soared as three great flags unfurled at once above each of the attacking ship's masts. The all-seeing eye of the Church of the Goddess, the seven-spiked crown of Evanendale, and the closed fist of the Witch Hunter War. The Vermilion Viper. Ludlov said out loud, recognizing the great man of war that had come to the aid of Middendam against the Hornfolk long ago. For too long, the Viper had lain anchored in the harbor of Seestad, as Chappelle had mentioned during their stay in Bruchhaven. The sight of the great ship cleaving the waves was glorious. Ludlov's original excitement at the arrival of the Witch Hunter Order quickly turned into worry and fear. He assumed their rescuers had no idea of who and what was actually aboard the Scorcher, besides the pirates. Perhaps they would continue to wreck the ship with cannonballs and only discover that they had drowned the original party and an essential part of the treasure afterwards. He considered jumping into the water, but getting back to the beach was not an option with his hands tied. He would have to draw the Viper's attention somehow. Meanwhile, the pirates were doing their best to get organized and respond to the unexpected attack, but they were clearly matched. 
the witch hunter ship was larger, better armed, and had the advantage of surprise. Goodlove was confident their side would win. He just didn't want to go down with the pirate crew. He felt someone grabbing him and feared one of his enemies intended to take him hostage. But when he turned, he saw Captain Brokolov, armed with a large, curved dagger. Blessed Salenheim and Turmgard were right behind him. Captain, where did you get that? Ludlow asked. Dead pirate, Brokolov said with a shrug, and then proceeded to cut through the rope. Ludlow thanked his friend, feeling his sore wrists as he scanned the deck. There was chaos everywhere. Men were jumping into the waves, firing long rifles at the Viper, or trying to hide below deck. Amidst all the madness, he saw Gustav reunited with his backpack once more. The indomitable Flatlander came towards them at a phenomenal speed, considering his heavy luggage. You must have access to some sort of magic, Ludlow said, the way you always manage to retrieve that thing. No magic in his shit, Gustav replied. I just keep an eye on my things. It was in the hold, along with all of our weapons, by the way. And no, I didn't have time to pick up all those as well, but I got yours, since I got your old one lost between the spikes. He handed Federhell's pistol to Ludlow. It was useless without gunpowder, but Ludlow didn't have the heart to tell Gustav, especially since he believed the Flatlander had just offered him some sort of apology. I could do with a rapier as well, Ludlow said. But for now it looks like our enemies have lost all interest in us. I'd like to find a safe way to get off this ship above all. No such luck, I'm afraid, Tomgard said, as he handed Ludlow a cutlass to defend himself with. All the rowboats are full of frightened little pirates. The Vermilion Viper drifted ever closer, and now Ludlow could see huge walls of wood standing straight up on the deck. Some of the pirates shot their long rifles at those constructions to no avail. Ludlow was still worried that the Scorcher might fire a cannon or two from the gun deck at the last moment, but apparently the pirates below didn't have the heart to make the attempt. When the Viper was close enough, the wooden walls were tilted down and revealed to be bridges for the Witch Hunter militia to cross over onto the Scorcher. Three of the wide and heavy bridges came crashing down, and ranks of stern men marched across, looking resplendent in their plate armor and crimson tabards. There was a standard bearer among them, holding aloft a banner depicting Santa Gwendala in all her glory. The few pirates who hadn't already fled the overwhelming force were mowed down by crossbows and pistols. The men who had been hiding below deck tried to flee through the portholes, but they couldn't possibly all get out in time before the fury of the Order's wrath. Ludlow and his companions just stood there, staring in disbelief at what was happening. In a matter of minutes, the Scorcher had been completely conquered. The chest still stood in the middle of the deck, untouched. Once the last of the militia had crossed the boarding bridges, Ludlow saw a tall, dark and elegant figure appearing out of the smoke from the cannons, confidently striding over the middle boarding bridge his long cloak billowing in the sea breeze. Four witch hunters followed in his wake. Ludlov, my lad, Lord Adomir said, it is good to see you alive and well. Lord Adomir, Ludlov said, inclining his head. Turmgard, I knew I could count on you. Blessed Zelenheim, I am most pleased to see you are still with us. Then Adomir arched a single eyebrow in Gustav's direction. Astounding. Even the shopkeeper has survived. Gustav beamed with pride. Lord Adomir, Ludlov began, but he was still so overwhelmed that he didn't know what to say. A mysterious smile appeared on his mentor's features. When I heard there was need for a rescue mission, and Kotignac was involved, I knew it was time to send the fastest ship. Not with a party, but an army. Kotignac? Tomgard repeated. How did you know that? Adomir ignored the question when he saw the white gold chest in the middle of the deck. Is that it? The fabled treasure of Boneyard Bay? 
He sounded slightly disappointed to Ludlow's surprise, as the chest was more than impressive enough in his mind. Aye, Lord, Tomgard said. These are the personal possessions of Queen Sintrasha herself. Adomir gave a slight nod to the four witch hunters, who wordlessly proceeded to lift the chest in order to carry it to the Vermilion Viper. Then, I suppose we have what we need, Adomir said. Oh no, Lord, Tomgard reacted. This chest is merely the centerpiece. There's another one, made of black metal, in the tunnels beyond that cave on the beach. And then the rest of it. The rest of it as a hoard of wealth beyond anyone's imagination. In fact, I don't know how we'll ever get it all out of here. The witch hunter lord looked much more pleased now. Leave that to us, Tormgard. Leave that to us. Thank you for listening to the 11th episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, A Witch Hunter Tale. These are some of the people supporting us financially, emotionally, and in a very American cheerleader kind of way to keep creating these audio stories. Arno Teva, Jalen Lewis, Caitlin Bredenkamp, Kat Mosseri, Osarion, Ryan Stock, Cody Heitsch, Kadir Hussein, Cameron Brantley, Joseph Stowell, Liam Gabriel, Tony Ranico, Peter Strandkrone, Amy Austin, Matt Petain, Yeezy Doucht, Mix and Match. You should really check out the YouTube channels of Osarion and Mix and Match. Osarion is in game development and co-working on games like Dex and Daggers and Unsung Warriors. You should definitely check out their Kickstarter. Mix and Match creates great mixes of songs from movies by indie artists and other popular projects. You're bound to find something on his channel that will appeal to you. We also have a number of graphic artists among our patrons. We're really grateful to get to know these talented people, so I'm giving them an extra shout out. A huge thanks to all of you supporting us in whichever tier on Patreon with your reviews, word of mouth, comments and purchases. Thank you. Also, because this is the last time you will hear my voice. In the outro of the treasure of Boneyard Bay. We have decided to leave the outro out of the last episode because we'll have end credits. And after the final scene, we want to give you the time to take it all in. It's not the end. Come and have a friendly chat with us on Discord, or come to discuss the story after you've finished it. Then you can finally write something in the spoiler section. I bet you've been waiting for that. Or you can share your creative work in the shameless promotion section. You've been very patient, waiting a whole week between the episodes. Should you reach a point where you can no longer wait, as you know it's always hardest to maintain a diet right before the final day, the extended edition is still available on Bandcamp, or you could get hold of it by becoming a patron. Take a peek on patreon.com slash audioepics. All links are in the description and the pinned comment. We hope you'll return next week for the last episode, episode 12, which will start with the chapter The Beast. Another promising chapter title there. And five other chapters. I'm going to leave you now wondering about how we could possibly have filled six more chapters. Yes, we have. And it is without the epilogue that is exclusively in the extended edition. So don't miss it. Make sure to subscribe and ding ding if you don't want to miss a thing. I'm off now with the last run of the trailer for Counterbalance as part of their awesome Swapping Trailers initiative. This is a fantasy audio drama by Blighthouse Studio. Domin plays a very small part in episode 5. If you're into Where's Waldo, you'll have fun looking for his voice. So, as I say goodbye, Here's the trailer for Counterbalance. 
Hello, Aria. Did you want to listen in on me and Rock enjoying ourselves? Don't encourage Should I describe to you what we're doing um, right now? Picasso? Huh? What's going on? Let's see. Look, these wind shells document anything you do in order to banish the spirits. I don't banish spirits. I'm fixing the tango. Of course, we can't open a new hole into the Aetherweb every year. But spirits aren't always bad. Are Those they? are exactly the reason Tangleweeds happened in the first Akasar, place. I'm sure Rocka knows how to get through a water gate without disrupting the magic balance. So what happens when there's a hole in the weave? Does magic <laughs> pour out? It is already broken! Let more of air into this world! I'll destroy Wait, no, every single no. one of them! You've had enough already! I will kill you, you filthy Whoa, whoa, whoa! Calm down, Rocka! Try it, fellow duster! God, ferocious runemaster! Your friction will grind the weave away! <sighs> Yarta. In moments like these, I wish I could see the rooms. What's wrong, Raka? Is that Tangleweave maybe too difficult even for someone as great as you? Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts from.